he wanted to be a gangster so bad, you know, and he actually came from a two parent home, you know, good mother and father. I went to the house. And so right. and I'm not, you know, saying nothing that yeah, nobody yeah, right, don't right, right, right. know. And I think that once he got that power and that money, he went too much to the gangster side. Mm -hmm. We should have went to the, you know, Barry yeah. Gordy side, yeah. right? It was like yeah. P, you know, yeah. went to the industrial, you know, the exactly. entrepreneurial right. side. I'm home What's up, world? It's your boy, Big Court, from the Holding Court Podcast. You already know what it is, broadcasting live from California, IA, man, all the way to Kansas City, Missouri. What's cracking with you, producer Ken? Hey, I see Oakland again. You know I'm a Northern California guy. So <laughs> I'm, I'm, a Sacramento, I'm a Sacramento guy, so I love seeing Northern California in the house. Yes, sir. The, yeah, yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, yeah. Hey, man, listen. We got the homie, bro. I consider him a brother. Consider him a friend, man. We got producer extraordinaire. Uh, how many Emmys? I got Emmy and eight Image Awards, in NAACP Image Awards. So. Exactly. Pop your collar one time for the homie, so you know what I'm saying, for oh, my boy. producer homie, yes. P. Frank Williams. What's cracking with you, homie? I'm in the building. I got my red cup, a little sip, a little something cool, <laughs> not too crazy. Thanks yeah. for having me in the building, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I've been trying to get you in here for a minute, man. Yeah, it's good. Uh, man, this is a good brother right here, man. We met a couple years back, Yeah. Um, you know, and he embraced me, just, you know, just... I guess real recognize real. Yeah, like that I, KC yeah, 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 love is always good. <laughs> oh, always. Except for hey, Chiefs. We talk, we talk about that all the yeah, time. Yeah, that's the Bay Area. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. All the way to back to Mac Drizzle. Oh, yeah, right, absolutely. You know yeah. what I'm saying? We always had a kinship with the Bay. Um, yes. What part of uh, Oakland are you from? Well, I grew up in East Oakland. Okay. Uh, 11th Avenue, Foothill. Um, I grew up in an area called Funktown. Mm -hmm. Another area, 19th and East 23rd, called Mother Dove. So, you know, I'm East Oakland born. A lot of family in 98th. Way in deep East Oakland, so mm -hmm. I'm in East Oakland all way. Okay, all day, yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm curious. Um, what 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 music did you grow up on? Like, what what hip hop inspired you? Well, you know, uh, before I was even into hip hop, I was uh -huh. into funk. You know, my my mother, who was a young mother, couldn't get a babysitter, and so I seen Parliament Funkadelic. I seen yeah. Teddy P. Yeah. You know, I seen the spaceship when it landed. You yeah. know what I mean? Uh, uh, let's see, uh, Curtis Blow. Mm -hmm. I remember going to Run DMC at 84 at the Oakland Coliseum, 85, mm. Fresh Fest, you know, when I had the Pumas, I had to have the Adidas with the matching, you know what I mean? Yeah, When yeah. I had the cardboard before. Y'all yeah. not, y'all not really born at 84, 83 like No, buddy. real shit. I know y'all yeah, with the, nah, I know y'all with just the, a all little bit young. I'm just a little bit young. Yeah, you. so yeah, so I mean, I, <laughs> I grew up around music and I, obviously music is in my blood, mm -hmm. growing up in the Bay Area. You know, obviously from the Pointer Sisters to Sheila E, the mm -hmm. Tower of Power, mm -hmm. to Billy Graham, you know, Tony, Tony, Tony. You know, it's our soil is always produced. You know what I mean? To even to um, break it on my other guy, uh, Sly and the Family Stone. Yeah, came from the Bay Area. So yeah, mm -hmm. the Bay Area, the soil got music in it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So uh, let me ask you, how influential was the Black Panthers uh, in your childhood, being that they were, you know, uh, centered right there in Oakland? In the well, Bay? no, I grew up around the Black Panther Party. My brother, mm -hmm. my uncle, was in the Black Panther Party. Um, I saw them giving groceries out in East Oakland. You know, mm -hmm. I saw them in my neighborhoods. And so, you know, I always tell people that I'm like the grandson of Huey, mm -hmm. right? I'm, I'm just doing what they did. They use guns to try to po patrol police because of police violence, you know, and I use a video camera mm -hmm. to try to tell the same story. So the Black Panther Party is preeminent. You know, mm -hmm. I'm, like I said, you know, with me and Pac, you know, rest in peace, we, we doing what they told us to do, you know, mm -hmm. go out and use music and messages to try to change our community. So, um, you know, as much as I'm in the, you know, music part, I'm about mm -hmm. the politics, about right. our communities, you know, and Huey and Bobby, that's what they instilled in us, you know. Okay. Yeah. What was um what was the temperature like in your in your day growing up in Oakland? I mean, cause I know you're a little bit older, so yeah. you know, before the crack era, you know, Oh, it was all love. I mean the seventies, mm -hmm. like I said, the Panthers, uh community stuff, you know, I don't think until it got you know, into the early 80s when it started going a little bit crazy with the crack and all of that. Mm -hmm. But community, people taking care of one, one another. You know, the Bay Area is a weird place because as street and rough, with Jerry Curls and Finger Waves and Cadillacs and yeah. Caprices and, you know, yeah. Mustangs and all of the wild stuff that we used to do, very communal, very about the, the politics of people, very much about helping each other. You know what I mean? And a lot of what you see, Tupac is a perfect example of like a child who grew up you know, whose mother was in that world, in that environment. Mm -hmm. And you could see how he was one hand, you know, Brenda's got a baby, but then, you know, I wonder right. if they call you bitch. And so we right. were very like political, mm -hmm. but also street. 
Mm-hmm. So, you know, Oakland is all over me. You know, I even got to Oakland. I'm yeah. rocking my Raiders today. You know, we we haven't been having a good time, but yeah. you know, I'm, still, <laughs> I'm still down with the nation. That's you know what uh, I mean? Just I know you're down with the, oh, with you the Chief know, Nation, Kansas so I ain't even got to get man. it, you know. We're gonna Chiefs keep it, Kingdom, We're going to keep it peaceful in, in, your, in your studio. <laughs> yes. Raiders, though. Raider Nation, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, so I guess were you young enough to to remember the reign of, like, Felix Mitchells and and – and yeah, you know, it's D's. ironic that you mentioned uh, Felix Mitchell, mm-hmm. um, our producer show called American Gangster, mm-hmm. when then it became American Gangster Trap Queens. Mm-hmm. Um, I produced the episode mm-hmm. uh, about Felix Mitchell. Mm-hmm. I saw Felix Mitchell in real life. Right. Um, and, you know, it was a part of that wave. One of the main reasons I was, like, needed to get out of Oakland because it was so dangerous. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, one of my uncles worked for Big Harv. You know, Harvey mm-hmm. was like a street, you know what I mean, person in my neighborhood and mm-hmm. Mickey Moe. And so they was battling with, with Felix. So mm-hmm. we was up against him from a street perspective in terms of how my uncle and other people was fooling with Harv and then fooling with Mickey. And so they was, they was battling, they was killing each other. They mm-hmm. was killing each other in my neighborhood. So I'm not, mm-hmm. you know, I identify it with on a like street yeah. level. Yeah. You know what I mean? I was a kid in the hood. I wasn't, you know, mm-hmm. necessarily slinging dope, but I was there right. and saw it. But yeah, I, I did the Felix Mitchell, unsung, I mean, uh, American Gangster, okay. which I produced, which I went back to 69 Village. We, I just saw Yuck. Yeah. Shout out to Yuck. Me yeah. and Yuck went back to 69 Village where he grew up, where Felix reigned. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you want to check that out on BT, yeah, that was, that was a crazy. And he had kids on the top of the roofs selling drugs. Mm-hmm. You know, he was, mm-hmm. I really think people don't realize, but New Jack City, most people believe, is about Felix Mitchell, mm. right? Okay. In terms of the kids. I didn't know that. The crack houses, yeah. the watchers on the top of the buildings, yeah. Yeah. set up like a whole corporation. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure if people know that, but Felix Mitchell was a big inspiration oh, wow. for uh, New Jack City. Okay. Wow, wow. So you've seen your share of violence, um, like, right there in real time growing up in, in East Oakland. Yeah, you know, I, I don't, you know, I just did a whole show about murder, which we'll talk about, mm-hmm. and... Um, you know, seeing people get shot and killed, yeah. I think, you know, I never wanted to be like glamorized, like I'm right. from the hood or I'm a gangster. But I mm-hmm. think people who really seen that and grew up in that, mm-hmm. you don't advocate that because right. the trauma from it is very deep. And, you know, mm-hmm. being able to, I saw my, you know, grandfather shoot my uncle when I saw people getting shot in my neighborhood. And, you know, I grew up in a building um, on 19th and East 24th where like four or five of the homies from one building got murdered. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I think that that time in the late 80s, early 90s was just... Mm-hmm. You know, like the Wild Wild West, right. you know, where people are shooting and killing and so much money on the street. Yeah, for And sure. I see it now to today, but, you know, I don't uh, I don't celebrate that. I think, right. you know, it's troubling because as much as we talk about hardcore hip hop, yeah, it's like Tupac. Yeah. The more you put death and destruction out in the music, the more it's going to come back to for you. For sure. So, yeah, um, yeah I mean, I've I seen it, but I don't celebrate it. So let mm-hmm. me ask you, so... You, I mean, you are obviously, were you always a, a virtuosic kid, like a creative kid, you know what I'm saying? Where, like you said, you chose to go with the arts. I mean, did you always want to get into being a producer or, or, or music well, or well, video? You know, it's so funny. I always tell people the way I actually got into telling stories, because I don't really consider myself a producer, mm-hmm. even though I'm a producer or whatever else, or exec producer. I'm a storyteller, you know, from my work in the source that you saw from, you know, when I wrote the covers of Dre and Snoop and you know, Suge and all of that. Uh, When I was a kid, probably like around 11 or 12, you know, the homies in the hood couldn't write love letters for their girlfriends. So they put the little kid with the big glasses and the afro, this gotta be like early 80s, be like, little homie, you know, hey, here's $10, you know, hey, Shakisha, baby, (laughs) what she look like, you know, what she wear? So I was always scribing for him, get me a little 10, $20 that way. So, you know, there's always those kids in the ghetto in the hood that the big homies take care of. You're like, no, he can't get into nothing, you know. Mm-hmm. It's like boys in the hood mm-hmm. when he tell Trey to get out the car. Right. And so that's me. And that happened to me in real life too, mm-hmm. by the way, when I was in the car where we was about to go get somebody and I had to, you know, mm-hmm. step out because I had too much to lose. But mm-hmm. no, I've been blessed to, you know, the streets took care of me. In my hood, they was like, you know, that's the young homie. And I'm so blessed, you know, Funk Town, where the doves I come from, they, they give me a lot of love now because, you know, when you're in those environments, you could go right or left, right? Right, exactly. And you got to be very careful because exactly. I saw a lot of my homies you know, I had one homie named Leonard who I grew up with in my hood and, and, and uh, murdered Dubs, who was a good kid, you know, great, great family, uh, got caught up in the streets, ended up going to jail, was just a fluke, you know? And so I was always aware, you know, and you, you friends with Pete, you know, there's a short game and there's a long game, right? Mm-hmm. The short game when you grow up in the hood is you want to be the dope boy, he got the car, he got the bras, you know, everything is popping. But sooner or later, he's going to go to jail, right? Yeah. And then people don't understand that, that part of, that's the real part of it. So as right. a person who saw that they was balling right now, getting all of the fly chicks, and you might not be 
whatever, you know, it's like Cube said, it's a marathon right. and not a sprint. And so I saw that as a kid. I'm not sure I had that game. The mm-hmm. game just came to me, you know, um, from it. But yes, uh, I avoided those pitfalls and have been very lucky, mm-hmm. you know, because so many people around me have been murdered and mm-hmm. went to jail and all kind of crazy stuff. Mm-hmm. So um, I just knew that there was something more than where I was at. I right. used to watch TV like Happy Days, um, uh, Nell, uh, what is that? Nell Carter. Nell Carter. The, yeah, I should watch it. Yeah, uh, different strokes where yeah. they was like living good. And yeah. I was like, you know, damn, I got this old TV. And, you know, we in this <laughs> housing authority apartment, yeah. but we're going to get up out of here one uh-huh. day. So, you know, I just was blessed to see the vision. You feel did, me? Did you have the support of your family? Oh, yeah, everybody. Mm-hmm. You know, it's mostly love. Mm-hmm. And I think that people, you know, my grandma bought me encyclopedias. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Just to be like, oh, shit. she was Come telling on, me, bro. you know, at 15, she gave me <laughs> condoms. Yeah, she was like, yo, yeah. you got to get up out of here. You can't be dating these little hood girls. And you, you're going to go somewhere else. So we need to protect you. You yeah. know what I'm saying? And, and don't get caught up. I remember I was in, in high school. I was like, I can't have sex with any of these hoochies. But damn, I want to, you know, because I'm like, I got to get up out of this spot. Yeah. And so I was fortunate enough to be able to, to do that. But yeah, man, you know, it's it's been a <laughs> it's been a wild ride, you yeah. know what I mean? And able to try to, you know, get out of the the streets yeah. into Hollywood or whatever. Yeah, that's yeah. funny that you say that because my grandmother used to make me read the encyclopedia too. Yes. These youngsters would yeah. never know what it's yeah, like. We like, showing our age saying yeah. encyclopedia. <laughs> she thought that was a big deal about me saying encyclopedias. Yeah. And I was like, I ain't reading these big long ass books. I my read kid, some of it. You know? My kids just pulled one out the other day. We was going through the garage and they were like, what is this? I was like, that's the encyclopedia. Look at that. <laughs> I don't know what that, that was is. A big I, had, deal. I got the one from my grandma that had all the pictures too later on. Yeah. Yes, like yes. the human body and all. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? We yeah. had the encyclopedia Britannica. Is that your Botanica. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No, but you know, I always knew. Um, mm-hmm. One thing I'll say is, I knew that knowledge is power, yeah. and that if you believe in yourself, and that you can, whatever. And I, I never say, you know, I don't think, you know, there's a kids in the hood that God just kind of picks, mm-hmm. and then you got to like, you know, keep up with it. But it mm-hmm. was tough though, you know, because you you grow up in those environments and you want the short term. And yeah, you know, I went to college in San Diego State and then Columbia University, and so I was blessed to do that and get a master's and I went on to the LA Times. So, I mean, mm-hmm. I pretty much out of school, I went mm-hmm. to work at a big company and mm-hmm. then started working with the source on um, freelancing and then, you know, wrote Easy E cover in 95 when Eric died. Mm-hmm. And I started writing bios for all the artists like Dog Pound, shout out to Daz, mm-hmm. Corrupt. I wrote Daz and Corrupt, his first bio yeah. back in 95. And, uh, you know- Were you here in LA? I was, uh, yeah. When I graduated okay. from college in New York at Columbia before mm-hmm. I got my master's in journalism, um, I ended up getting a job at the LA Times, mm-hmm. and uh, that was around the uh, mid '90s, right? right? The rise of Death Row. Mm-hmm. So I just happened to be there and clicked up with them, and you know, became cool with them. Mm-hmm. And then you know, shout out to uh, Papa G mm-hmm. from Death Row, and you know, Big Suge. Uh, you know, he's controversial, but yeah, he was a good guy at different points. And so, mm-hmm. you no, know, that's how I got in. I started writing freelancing for the source, mm-hmm. and that's how I got into the music journalism. And then mm-hmm. you know, Eric died in '95. <sighs> And Pac died in '96. I wrote both of those covers. When you look back at the source, I remember the source yeah, cover that. with with Easy on there. Yeah, with Eric. I still yeah. have it. I was at Eric's yeah. funeral. Yeah. Um, and then Pac died. I was at the hospital. Okay. There, because I was going back and forth between writing for the LA Times and the source, mm-hmm. and then that put me in the vortex with uh with Sugar Bear, mm-hmm. with Big Shug, and so I interviewed Shug in jail, mm-hmm. uh, which was a crazy thing. This is when he was on crutches. Right. And um, <clears throat> you know, I got to the day room, and it was a wild. You know, always tell people, you know, hip hop is a wild place. And so mm-hmm. this was the time when Suge, if anybody knows, he was married to Michelle A. I don't mm-hmm. know if people know that he was married and him and Michelle A. I didn't know she was married to Yeah, they was married to okay. him. And so I got to the day room and this gotta be two thousand, wait, no, ninety-nine, I don't know, somewhere around there, whenever Suge was in Mule Creek mm-hmm. and he was about to get out. And uh, I got to the day room. But first when I even got into the jail, they wouldn't let me take my notebook in. You know those little spiral notebooks mm-hmm. that you would have with mm-hmm. the little spirals in it? There was like could use it as a weapon. So I had to give that up until you leave. I don't know if you've been, you know, if you, I don't want to tell people you ain't been to jail, but I went into the day room, couldn't do that. So I took some paper towels from the, uh, you know, the vending machines and they had mm-hmm. paper towels over there and I had the little number two pencil. So I was scribbling my notes that way. Um, I got to the table and Michelle A was sitting there. Mm-hmm. True story. And uh, I'm like, what's up? She's like, well, who are you? What are you doing here? And uh, I was like, well, I'm the writer. She's like, and I can't do her voice, but you don't look like no writer to me. <laughs> I had the little nap, you know, little yeah, dreads. And yeah. I look more like a B-boy. Yeah. And then, you know, Suge came out and we talked. And, you know, he said, unfortunately, some really kind of provocative stuff. And if you know Suge, and he was dissing yeah. Eddie Murphy and Prince and just just going off. You know, Suge, yeah. at that point, I think was just on one. So, yeah. you know, I mean, that, that period of the 90s, uh, 
it's so volatile, mm -hmm. you know, with Puff mm -hmm. and Bad Boy and mm -hmm. Suge and me representing the West. And then, you know, had Tupac died yet? He did, yes. Okay. Tupac okay. was already yeah, dead yeah, when right, Suge right. was in jail. Okay. And so, yes, yes. Yeah. And then yeah, later, yeah. obviously, when he got out of jail, I interviewed mm -hmm. him um, at his office. And uh, that's the day he came out. He uh, opened up his briefcase. I'm like, Suge, what's up? He's like, you know, he has some diamond handcuffs in the motherfucker. Yeah. He's like, you know, you can't put a nigga, rich nigga like me and, you know, whatever he was saying. And I'm like, Suge, you better drink that Diet Coke because, yeah. you know, he had diabetes or something like that. So yeah. he needed, it was ironic <laughs> that he was so gangster, but he still needed to drink a Diet Coke, right. you know, and he had piranhas in the office mm -hmm. and the, all of the blood red carpet and yeah. all of that shit, all kind of crazy stuff. This was when Defro was on Wilshire. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm dating myself, but mm -hmm. Defro used to be on Wilshire. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. What was your so did you have a close relationship with Suge or just that? I think we were cool. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the good and bad things about Suge, I think mm -hmm. that he was cool with me, and I'm gonna feel see this, is that uh I wasn't afraid of him. Mm -hmm. And he said some shit that wasn't right. And I had to call him out on that. He talked about Farrakhan, Eddie Murphy, but you know, he was down with the hood and did some stuff, but I wasn't afraid, but some of the stuff he was saying was not cool. Mm -hmm. And so I don't want to totally do that, but I still celebrate Suge as one of the greatest pioneers of black music and definitely mm -hmm. hip hop on the West Coast. Without Suge and Death Row, you know what I mean? And really yeah. Eric, probably, if you want yeah. to really get to the whole real, nest real without shit. Eric, real shit. none of that happens yep. or whatever. But, uh, you know, uh, it was a complicated relationship. Okay. And uh, I pray for him and I wish that he would have, he had multiple opportunities, I think, to go in a better direction about some of that and. You know, just mm -hmm. be a little bit yeah. wiser. Yeah. Right. I'll just right. say it that way. Right. <clears throat> what do you attribute that to him dropping the ball? Just youth, youthful ignorance? I or? can't say that. You know, one thing mm -hmm. I'll say about Suge, a brilliant guy, mm -hmm. good, actually a sweet guy when you actually get to talk to him. You know, I think mm -hmm. that, um, I think I'm not the first person to say this mm -hmm. about him, is that he wanted to be a gangster so bad, you mm -hmm. know, and he actually came from a two parent home, mm -hmm. you know, good mother and father. I went to the house. And so right. was, and I'm not, you know, saying nothing that yeah, nobody yeah, right, right, right. No. And I think that once he got that power and that money, he went too much to the gangster side mm -hmm. where he should have went to the, you know, Barry yeah. Gordy side, yeah. right? It was like yeah. P, you know, yeah. went to the industrial, you know, the exactly. entrepreneurial side, mm -hmm. building businesses, entrepreneur. He would have had so many fucking P got chips and mm -hmm. fucking yeah. cereal now, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, right. That's what should have stayed. Yeah, you don't, you don't shit. need to be yeah. beating motherfuckers up and, you know, mm -hmm. You know, making him drink urine in the studio. Right. Yeah, right. you could argue that he might be one of the most powerful if he had gone that. Route. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. If Death Row would have stayed on the course that they did, mm -hmm. oh man. You know what I mean? I think even when I did the Dr. Dre, if you there's a famous source cover where Dr. Dre is in a uh, electric chair. Yeah. Right behind him. Right when he, he left. Said it, when he yeah. left Death Row. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote that story back in '96. Shout out to Dr. Dre. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think mm -hmm. Dre wanted to leave what he built. But it was so dangerous and volatile. You know, I remember, uh, rest in peace, Nate. Uh, Nate said he used to go up to death row with a gun in each pocket because mm -hmm. it was very active with the Bloods and mm -hmm. the Crip situation. So I think if you would have stuck to the business part mm -hmm. instead of trying to be, you know, super blood, mm -hmm. MOB, it would have been a different outcome. Because you see, obviously, how Dog turned out, Snoop. Right. You see how Dre turned out. You right. see how Daz is, you know, right. everybody is still, we still going and, mm -hmm. you know, everybody is whatever. And that... Mm -hmm energy that he put out um, cost him, you know? Yeah, you know, we had Mob James uh, on the show. Oh yeah, I show. saw that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I saw that. That, was, spoke, that was good. He kind of spoke to the same thing, you know, cause he grew up with Suge, you know, and uh, Reggie, shout out to the homie Reggie Wright. He had grew up- Reggie, what up, pimp? Yeah, yeah, what up, Reggie's, Reggie you Reggie know. was in the parking lot with me uh -huh. that when I was interviewing Suge at the jail. So Reggie, you know, me oh, and him really? was in the parking lot. Oh, okay. Me and Reggie met in the parking lot before I went into the jail. Oh, okay. Yeah, shout out to the homie Reggie. Me and Reggie, we, we chop it up sometime. Um, Reggie, you a wild boy though. <laughs> Reggie, I know would you say Reggie. whatever. Yeah, you be doing some Reggie crazy. was Reggie, Reggie would troll a motherfucker. Yeah, he, uh, we did, uh, <laughs> we did, uh, uh, who shot Biggie and Tupac? Yeah, on uh, on uh, Fox, and uh -huh. then I did another one on A and E. Who you know who mm -hmm. killed Tupac with yeah. Big Crump? Remember that? Yeah. And so Reggie was in there. <laughs> you know, Reggie's a KG individual. <laughs> That's all I'm gonna say. Yeah. Hey, let me ask you. So being that you did, yeah, I want to touch on that because you have done a lot of work and obviously you being the the you know the the producer with the integrity that you have, you've done your due diligence on the shit that you do. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like what who they has said killed Tupac or or I should say Biggie, because you did Tupac and Biggie, mm -hmm. correct? Do you think who they're saying killed Biggie is the person that really I, killed him? The Biggie him? situation is just too murky. Mm -hmm. I couldn't put the, the two on the ten on that, as we mm -hmm. say in the turf. Right. Um, it's a touchier one, mm -hmm. you know, because some people say it was one of Shrek's homies. 
Yeah, that which will so, be Poochie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The people have said that, which I think is probably the best. But there is Rafael Perez. There's right. other stuff connected to it. Right. And even if he may have pulled the <clears throat> trigger, mm -hmm. there's other people involved in it, right? Right. right. Whereas, you know, with Pac, obviously Orlando shot him. And, is it obviously? Though? Yeah, I think so, obviously, yeah. Really? I think. Because I'm going to be honest with you. I didn't hear from people from over that way that, it, no, it, I, I, I wouldn't say I, I was yeah. not the, there, right, so I right. can't be definitive. But well, just in terms it. of what you, you know, I just think that yeah. he bragged about it from what I know. Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously, if you know anything about history, there was a gang war right mm -hmm. after Pac got shot. For sure. And, you know, um, by the way, I interviewed Suge for Who Shot Biggie and Tupac with Fox and Soledad, which I produced. Mm -hmm. um, and Suge was on the phone. And Suge, you know, I don't know if he wants to admit this, but he said, I looked over in the car and I knew them all. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you know anything about the history of those two mm -hmm. sets, they have been going against each other for right. many years before right. that happened. So it wasn't as if right. the people in the <clears throat> car knew him. Exactly. I think Pac put himself in a situation where he was trying to be gangster. And everybody knows, like yeah. I'm friends with Edie, these are my people, you know, mm -hmm. Young Noble. It's not like I'm trying to say nothing disrespectful. Mm -hmm. But I think he underestimated, he underestimated that move. Yeah. And I think, you know, one thing I've learned as a reporter at the LA Times and then at the Source, and as you can see now from you know what happened to PMB and different people, yeah. uh, these gangs in LA don't play. Yeah, they don't fuck around. I'm from yeah. the Bay and we do whatever, but right. you know they will kill you. Yeah, and I think Pac got caught up in that situation. So obviously I wasn't there, mm -hmm. but all roads do seem to lead <clears throat> yeah. to Orlando, and because allegedly he did brag about it. Right, that's the only right. thing I would say from people that I know where he supposedly said it. Right. Yeah, yeah. And he had a reason, right? And, and yeah. you from the streets. There, what, what what motive? Yeah. Did he have a motive? Shit. Real shit. Yeah. That's that's yeah. A motive, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. Do you do you believe? So you believe what Keefy D says? You believe his story? Uh, <laughs> I don't know if I want to say I believe much of what Keefy D says, but mm -hmm. obviously he was in the car. Right. From everybody knows. That's why I think when Suge mm -hmm. said I knew them. Yeah. He was referring because him to and Keefy D grew up together. Correct. There's yeah. pictures of Suge and yeah. Keefy D and leagues as yeah, kids exactly but they're in obviously warring mm -hmm. sets yeah or whatever um yeah i, I do believe <clears throat> that orlando did it yeah i, I, I would you. say that and i've done enough research now right. i'm just talking on my ass right and right, right. The, the records that i've done mm -hmm. on shows and i've talked to enough people and we found the gun yeah by the way on who uh killed tupac and annie yeah. with ben crump we did able to locate mm -hmm. the gun um that actually did the shooting yeah let me ask you um, when you do these these type of uh, documentaries, this type of content, uh, how how deep do you do you uh, like how much do you have to investigate to make sure that everything is on point? Like how much time do you spend? You know, because you damn near got to be like a detective to uh, really put the. Well, shit I'm not together. the police though. Right. <laughs> make sure you understand. I never be the right, police. Right, right, so, yeah, right, yeah. right. That's not I'm here. I'm not the. But like, just, yeah, but I'm just, you know, because like, you want to be, you want to be, no, but you want to be yeah. factual with the story that you. Yeah, and you got to. I think you know, as a journalist, I think. <clears throat> Excuse me. The number one thing that helps me mm -hmm. is that I'm a storyteller. And that if you talk to two people, you're like, "Oh, you heard with Big Court over there." You're like, "Oh yeah, he did such and such." Mm -hmm. Then I talk to three people. Then I talk to four, five, six, seven, and they said I was there. So you know, you, uh, it starts to make more sense. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I try to do as much investigation as I can and mm -hmm. talk to the right people and hopefully people who were there. Mm -hmm. And obviously, like my new show, I did, and just even with the Who Killed Tupac with with Ben Crump. Mm -hmm. that we did on a and &E, the more we talked to people, the more troops came out. So you can't, you, you can't disrespect the investigation if the truth points back mm -hmm. to it, mm -hmm. you know? And I do think that there's a disrespect and a, not a disrespect, but a lack of trust for authority mm -hmm. and police in our right. communities. Right. And so I think that somebody like myself who mm -hmm. talked to talk, you know, who's been there and I'm right. not there to like snitch or yeah, do exactly. whatever. Exactly. I just want to, you know, yeah. I, my job in my career is about you know when you take a picture of something mm -hmm. i take a picture of whatever it is like a polaroid and then i just show it back to you yeah this is what i saw mm -hmm. you make your own judgment mm -hmm. after i've talked to all these people and interviewed and did whatever so mm -hmm. yeah i mean i i do have to do a thorough investigation yeah. and, and a lot of these shows you know the lawyers are up the ass right you know you would imagine how many lawyers that have to do something for a and e right. and fox and watching it and who said this and accusing people without that so mm -hmm. i'm not the homie just putting shit on the internet exactly that's just like you know false whatever exactly. and just you know 
doing Kanye. That's what I was hitting to. Yeah, I'm not doing no Kanye to. where I'm just making some false shit or just yeah. saying some shit out of my ass. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? I'm, I'm doing the real investigation. You yeah. Know? yeah, speaking of Kanye, since you brought him up, <laughs> <laughs> which I was going to wait, but since yeah. you, you know, you we did that, to, we'll we just, just had this combo. yeah, we'll just segue right into that. You know what I'm saying? What, what, what's your take on Kanye and his stance and, and everything that he has said? Do you that's believe that one. he is anti-Semitic and do you no. believe what he's saying is- I think that some of the stuff, there's truth in it, like the Kyrie mm -hmm. thing and- there's some, you know, factual truth to some of it. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know because of the work I do. You got to be careful what you say about certain mm -hmm. groups because right. they're very powerful in right. the industry that I work in, and so you mm -hmm. got to be smart. Mm -hmm. And I do think, you know, the problem that I have is Kanye is not that he doesn't say. If he says a hundred things, maybe about seventy-five of them are probably true, or some there's mm -hmm. some truth in it. Mm -hmm. But he's so uh, egotistical. Mm -hmm. and arrogant mm -hmm. to me like Kyrie yeah. where it seems to be about them and not about whatever mm -hmm. and they don't seem to have they got too many yes people around them they don't have no OG or somebody be like well, hey why don't you say it this way or whatever and you know I can't sit in Kanye's shoes I'm not that man mm -hmm. but I will say um, you know one of the funniest things that I not funniest but one of the worst things I think that ever happened to celebrity mm -hmm. was social media Mm -hmm. Because when I worked at the store, so when I was writing the LA Times, in order for you to talk to a celebrity, you got to go to a publicist. You can't mm -hmm. do all of this. Like mm -hmm. when I would do a, a review of the albums in the source, it come out two months later. You know, there was a wall between you mm -hmm. and the celebrity. A celebrity couldn't just start talking. Mm -hmm. And so I think that social media has unfortunately um, hurt people like Kanye yeah. Yeah. and Kyrie because they just start talking without the right factual situations mm -hmm. behind them. And and you know, both of those brothers, brilliant brothers, and I'm all for black strength and yeah. you know talking about mm. things but it seems to be an arrogance with them both and mm -hmm. it's so funny i've been debating this with so many people mm -hmm. because again i think kanye is brilliant i think he's whatever but i think he's an egomaniac and a mm -hmm. guy who is a bipolar guy he mm -hmm. needs to take i have friends who are bipolar he obviously mm -hmm. needs medication and just the way he posts and does it and just so mm -hmm. erratic so manic yeah. yeah and i think that he misses his mother i think he has too many yes people around him i have some people mm -hmm. that i know who work with him and Mm -hmm. And nobody's saying, "Hey, that's a dumbass decision." Right. The right. homie, like you know, saying, "Yo, bro, don't don't do that." Yeah, yeah. You know, I'll ask you this same question I asked Yuck. So, do you think that? So, you see, what Kyrie, all he did was post the book, Correct. the Hebrews to the Negroes, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then one could pose the question: Why isn't Amazon and Jeff Bezos being held to the same standard, being that they sell the book? Mm -hmm. Right. So does that make what they're saying altogether kind of true, the argument? I think everybody's sort of, uh, I guess the right way to say it is implicated. I don't know if that's mm -hmm. the right way to say it, but um, I'm going to use this analogy. And I know this is like the right thing to say. It may not be politically correct, but when you're the pimp, you set the terms. When you're the hoe, you don't set the terms. Mm -hmm. So when you're Amazon, mm -hmm. you're here, right here, and you can do whatever and the money and the power that you have. Mm -hmm. And when you're just sort of Somebody just talking about that. And as an athlete, now Kyrie is such a famous person, is already polarizing. People can't wait for you to do something. So right. you should already be on top of that. And so I think that um, motherfuckers can't wait to cancel you. And mm -hmm. if you're Kyrie, who you know people don't necessarily, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, I just think you got to be smart. All okay. right. Because that just cost him hundreds of thousands of dollars, publicity, right. millions probably because of all his deals. And I'm yeah. not saying that you should. Be afraid of yeah, you know Nike or money. capitalism, yeah. but at yeah. the same time, you still got to be smart about mm -hmm. how you move. That's the only thing I'll say. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that Kanye and both Kyrie have not been wise mm -hmm. in the way that they presented things. Right, That's right. It. Do you think that being smart is basically um, playing your position and being that you have influence and you have resource instead of causing a stir and just talking shit, more or less, just get busy? And, and make the I'm not sure. I don't really have yourself. an answer on that. I just know mm -hmm. that um, it's how you present things. If it mm -hmm. was presented as a dialogue mm -hmm. or whatever between, you know, talking about black people and there's a connection between Hebrews and, mm -hmm. you know, and Jews. I mean, it's historically, I'm not mm -hmm. saying whatever. I don't know all the whole facts, but right. there is some factual mm -hmm. part to what he's saying that's not, mm -hmm. not true. Um, and so, you know, I just think you got to be wise about the moves you make. And I right. always say it's, it's, it's chess, not checkers. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, so the source, I had Dave Mays on the show. Dave Mays. I, yeah, what up, Dave Mays? Yeah, go, Dave. go, Dave. What up? <laughs> How did you get connected with the, uh, with the source? Wow. That's a crazy story. Um, when I was at Columbia, I went to Columbia Journalism School. I got a mm -hmm. master's there in the early nineties. And, um, 
1994, the source did a cover with um, uh, Grandmaster Flash, Cool Herc, and Africa Kabambada. It's the 50th issue of the source. It's a historical mm-hmm. one. If you watch a white cover, mm-hmm. and they were all mm-hmm. at Columbia, they came to the school to do like a celebration or like a cover story party. And so I was a student, and Dave came there. And you know, at the time, the source was like, they call it the Bible. Mm-hmm. Um, and the source was the shit. You know, I was yeah. a b-boy. I read the shit from cover to cover. I couldn't wait to see whatever. And I was a writer at the LA not. Times. And yeah. you know, Willie really wasn't. I was doing cool stuff, but it wasn't that. Like the source mm-hmm. was like, ah. Mm-hmm. And so I bum rushed Dave. I bum rushed Dave at the auditorium at Columbia. And uh, I was like, yo, I want to write. Blah blah blah. What's up? He's like, yo, get in contact with my people. I think at the time it was a Dario Strange. Mm-hmm. And so I got in contact with him and. Let me write a couple articles from the, you know, because I was in the West Coast. Back then, they didn't really fuck with the West Coast. I don't want to know disrespect to the source or whatever, but I was at a time when the source didn't, and mainstream hip hop was like too short, can't rap, E40 is whack, Mm -hmm. they ain't got no lyrics, that West Coast shit is dumb. Like, I'm I'm really from that. I I know everybody is happy now that we're all like the number one artist is or whatever, but, um, and so I was able to kind of carve a niche. Mm -hmm. I started writing freelance, and my first article came out in 90. Early 95 was AMG. Mm-hmm. Bitch better have my money. Oh, shout out to the homie. Yeah, that's shout the out homie. to the homie. And yeah. so then that's how I got with Dave and started to write. And, and then I think once I wrote the Easy e cover in 95, that's what submitted me. Mm-hmm. And I ended up becoming a West Coast editor when we opened up a West Coast office. Mm-hmm. And then after that, <clears throat> um, became executive editor. Mm-hmm. You know, being that I, I'm from Kansas City, and like mm-hmm. we said before, we have a kinship with the Bay Area. Um, what was some of the first Bay Area music that I'm just curious that you that you got up on? Wow, some of the bass, first Bay Area music. Um, like I said, before the hip hop, before like Too Short, it got to specifically hip hop. Yeah, so yeah. specifically hip hop. When I, this got to be eighty. I was making music thirteen. Um, Blowjob Betty. Um, so Todd, <laughs> Todd. Yeah. Um, whatever that came out. Remember yeah. with the Blowjob Betty, yeah, Dolphin beat. Yeah, that was when like Todd had 80, the El Dorado eighty four. Yeah, eighty four, eighty five. Somewhere around there. Yeah. But before that, I was on like the. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Sugar Hill Gang, mm-hmm. Grandmaster Flash, Melly Mel. We didn't really have our records. Like Too Short, yeah. um, Freddie B, uh, Calvin, um, from, uh, I'm blanking on Calvin's name, from uh, Richmond. Mm-hmm. This was before, before Earl was out. Earl yeah. wasn't even out at this time. So the right. first people I thought was some of those people, and it's definitely Too Short, was yeah. a pioneer. When I was in the <clears throat> sixth grade, seventh grade, mm-hmm. I used to see Todd on the bus, the 40 bus that would go mm-hmm. down Foothill. Mm-hmm. Shout out to Too Short. And uh, he had his radio. Yeah. So that's when I had to have, when you had the cassette tapes, when you yeah, buy the cassette tapes, sure. and you would put on one side, and you would have it on the other side, yeah. you would like, do that. Yeah. And K-Poo was on then. You know, yeah, so early 80s, that was my, you know, Too Short is probably one of the first people that put us on the map. What did you think about 40 when he first came out with Mr. Flamboyant? Um, it's weird because I got it, mm-hmm. but my peers in college and where I was at at San Diego State, they were like, what is this shit? Yeah. And then, but Earl, I did Earl's uh, Unsung, two, four, you know, shout out to yeah. E-40. And uh, we talked about it, that mm-hmm. when he first came out, people was like, this, you're whack. They like it. He, we, we acknowledged it. And mm-hmm. I was like, oh, that's, that's our shit from the Bay. Like, yeah. he was talking our slang. And, yeah. You know what I mean? We got it. But yeah. nationally, it wasn't really mm-hmm. registering because it was right. so unorthodox and weird, mm-hmm. right? And he's like almost kind of off the beat. Yeah. He says words in a real yeah. kind of wild way. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he was a pioneer. You know, we used to go to RAS meetings. Rats Mutants, uh, Amoeba, if you're yeah, from the I Bay. Rats Beatles, yeah, and then yeah. you'll get a consignment. Yeah. You know, people know before we, all you young niggas. Yeah, yeah. The consignment yeah. deal consignment. where you get a certain amount of records. Because you had and, Dog and you Day, Rats Beatles. Yes, yeah. 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 C4. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. This is a different time. Yeah, yeah. So, so no, that was different. I think Earl, um, E40 is one of those people that he already had his blueprint. That's why you call, you know, mm-hmm. he just listened to his albums, his whole business things. I respect right. him as really just a beautiful mm-hmm. human being, number one. And just a great uh, husband. Mm-hmm. Obviously, his wife Tracy, and they've For been sure. together. And, sure. and Earl has just really kept his family close to him. And he's really like a entrepreneur. I don't mm-hmm. think that he gets before he gets the credit that he deserves as a pioneer of the language of hip hop. Right. Meaning how the people lingo. rap, yeah. the lingo, the words yeah. that they say, and the entrepreneurial spirit of owning mm-hmm. a spirits company. You know, having his own restaurants. He's always been that that mm-hmm. guy. And so. Mm-hmm. Um, shout out to Forty, yeah, just pioneered. Uh huh. You've been around hip hop for a long time and actually actively working in hip hop. What was your, what was your take on No Limit and P once 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 he emerged? Well, you know, again, I'll say 
I keep it 1,000 people I know. Mm -hmm. When we first, we was like, what the hell is this? Mm -hmm. It was a different, right? Yeah. You know, and uh, and obviously he well, came. Well, which P, though? Which, I'm talking about the, the early part. The, the before Bay he even got, P. the Bay Area okay. part. Before okay. he got to, when yeah. he got with when he uh, went back style, uh, uh, Beats by the Pound. Beats by the Pound. Yeah. The music went up, right? right? And it's yes. like with any artist. If you look yep. at my first articles, the first <laughs> lyrics that Pete put out, it wasn't all the way. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm in the No Limit, you know, documentary yeah. on BET. Yeah. I was yeah. there, and so I think that he was pioneering a way. He was a Southern guy, but finding his roots. Yeah, the Bay Area showed him the hustle. Yeah, that showed him that you could do it out the trunk. Mm -hmm. That you don't have to wait for anybody, right? Mm -hmm. He might have not got that same mentality. So, so P, from what I saw, took his hustle from the Bay Area. And mm -hmm. went back home and found his sound, and that's when he blew up and yeah. took off. And so, I mean, P P is up there with me with Puff. You know, I remember, you know, you wouldn't maybe remember, but when we was at the source, we used to do a thing called the Power 30, mm -hmm. right? And it's like the most powerful people. Mm -hmm. And slowly but surely, P started growing where Russell was at. P started mm -hmm. going where Puff was at. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And I think that he should be considered Luke, Puff, mm -hmm. uh, James Prince, yep. Russell Simmons. These are the guys who set the template to mm -hmm. do it on your own, you know yeah. what I mean? And a genius businessman. Right, why, why do you think that P doesn't get the, the credit, or like 40, like P, but specifically P, he doesn't get mentioned so much in the echelons of the Jay-Zs and I'm the I'm not Puffies. sure because I think, you know, <clears throat> there was some discussion about how great was the music, which I think it got mm -hmm. better as mm -hmm. No Limit For sure. went on. So there was some dissing of the, the yeah. music, right? And I right. remember it's so funny, I remember when we used to do the ads in the source mm -hmm. and then No Limits ads would be in the back, mm -hmm. right? With the pixel graphics and right. kind of like whatever. Yep. And then slowly but surely they got to more of the front and he mm -hmm. he worked us up and 504 mm -hmm. Boys and, yep. you know, I remember when Bow Wow and Romeo was going at it. So I just think that P, he wasn't in glamorous New York City, mm -hmm. right? He wasn't in LA. Mm -hmm. You know, he was out of the box. Like, and, and, and for what you, I don't know if you know, but mm -hmm. Southern rap, I guess, well, I want to do, do I want to say cash money, no limit, like that 99, 98. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's when it finally broke mm -hmm. through. Because I right. remember Flex used to never play nobody right. from the West right. Coast, and he would definitely play nobody from the South, right? Right, Because we had to do that. Because we they weren't considered good enough in right. the East Coast right. definition. Nobody was hip -hop, by, right? e by yeah. East Coast yeah. Yeah. And definition. So, and I yeah. remember when we they finally started to break through. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I think that um, the reason why P doesn't get it is because I think people stereotype Southern rap, and they don't mm -hmm. think it is as great right. as what Def Jam did, or you know. But I, I'm saying even past him as an artist. I mean, in terms of just the business acumen, him as a boss, like a Jay Z, because I, I mean, Puffy. I, I mean, do, I we, think, him, totally. do we think do we think that Puffy heard, yeah. is a, is a great rapper? You know what I'm saying? No, but I, I'm saying, but in terms of just as a as a mogul, you know, it's like he I think doesn't, over time more now people yeah. have. Right. But I think back then there was a diss about Southern rap that it yeah. wasn't as good, yeah. it wasn't as smart. I come from the Bay, E40 yeah. too short. I know when people say too short. I used to be at the source meetings, They're like, we're not gonna do whatever. He can't rap, that shit is whack. I literally, I literally <laughs> had to stand up yeah. for the West Coast right. there because, you know, mm -hmm. they didn't understand our diction and the way we talk. Right. Definitely not right. the South. That right. was even worse than the Bay. Yeah, real you shit. You know what I mean? Real shit. From a national New York yeah. perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, okay. So you you work so much in hip hop, bro, and you've actually, I mean, dug deep, right? So follow me on this. So, I mean, we're not that, you're a little bit older than me, but hip hop used to be fun. You know, we did have the gangster shit. You know, we had By the Ice way, tea. I'm not uh -huh. sure if people know, mm -hmm. but do you know what the five pillars, not like the B boy and mm -hmm. DJ and break dancing yep. graffiti? For sure. Right? But yep. the actual pillars are peace, love, unity, and having fun. Okay. Right? That's what the core of hip-hop yeah. is from those pillars. Which is since long lost and gone. Yes, but yeah. I'm just trying to make sure yeah. that people yeah. know that's if good you education. get into the root yeah. of it, that's what it was about. The right. community, you know, it started these people, they couldn't go to fucking, I remember Andre Harrell used to tell me, he's like, we tried to go downtown, they wouldn't let us in, right? Mm -hmm. they, only the people that fuck with us was the punk rockers. Mm -hmm. That's how Madonna gets in the mix with us. And no, mm -hmm. we're like the outlaws, you know what I mean? And we come mm -hmm. from a culture where there's no music education. So hip-hop is created out of nothing. You understand right. what I'm saying? Yeah, so I want to sure. make sure people know yeah. that's what the reason was before right. we got into the guns and the girls and exactly. the, the lean exactly. and all of that. Because, I mean, when if you start, like you said, from the inception, it was Sugar Hill Gang, it was party, it was fun. Then you had Grandmaster Flash who did the message. Correct. You know what I mean? So it became informative. Correct. Now, once we kind of moved to the West Coast, of course, we have the emergence of Ice-T. But even still with Ice-T and the gangster shit, you had the balance of, at least he always told you what the other side of the gangster shit was. Correct. So it was balanced. 
Then we get to NWA, we have it where it's kind of first person gangster shit, where it's not, I'm not talking about the shit that's going on, but I am that. Correct. You know what I mean? So what where do you think that it just went all bad to where we are now? Like, what do you think that cause is? Do you think that it's a, a myriad of things or do you think that it was, you know, what's your take on it? We got the crack era. I mean, where did it just become so vicious and violent to where it came off a record and now we where we are now? What do you think that's attributed to? Because you've really, been, you've seen it all. That's a that's a really great question. Um, it's a tough one. I mean, you could point to Tupac and Biggie when it became more dangerous. To just, mm -hmm. you know, I remember when that whole climate, ninety four, ninety five, ninety six, or whatever. After the Source Awards in ninety five, obviously was the catalyst, and some other things that happened with Sugar, or whatever. But once it got off the record, and that it was dangerous to be in a city. When I was in New York and people were like, yo, you're from the West Coast. You're like, I didn't really want to say I was from Cali. And then I'm in LA and people from New York was like, yeah, I don't want to come out here. Mm -hmm. It became dangerous where the street life got involved. You know, my new show, Hip Hop Homicides, which I'm sure we'll talk about. Mm -hmm. One of the things that the guy said in there is that you can't mix streets and the music, right? right. The streets is one thing. And 50 talks about it, 50 Cent. Mm -hmm. Once it got to where Pac got shot for some, literally some, Blood Crip shit, if you want to get into mm -hmm. the real yeah, of it. Exactly. Um, and That's then what Shook it is. got into yeah. that or whatever, and, and Big died. I think that was the place when it became not just about the music and party. NWA, you could say it was violent, or they would, you know, really they mm -hmm. were just telling their stories. Right. Public Enemy, to some extent, were telling their story mm -hmm. about growing up in Long Island. But I think in that mid 90s or whatever, and today I blame the cloud chasing, the internet, um, internet beefing, people mm -hmm. on guns, and just. Uh, the lawlessness and no respect for black life. But if you really, to me, around the early 90s, you right. know, because we tried to get the gang stuff better. Early 90s, there was a lot of truce stuff. Yep. So we was trying to like, yep. Minister Farrakhan, even Tupac, mm -hmm. we were trying to, you know, do right. And uh, it wasn't dangerous to be a rapper. Mm -hmm. I remember when the rapper was celebrated. Right, right. The DJ was celebrated. Mm -hmm. People like, oh my God, I can't wait to get an autograph from Too Short. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, is that, damn, is that Biggie Smalls? Yeah. And then it became... <clears throat> damn, we should go rob Pop Smoke. Right, right. But now, if we if we be... Go sorry, ahead. were you there at the Source Awards, 95? Uh, yes. No, sorry, 94. I was in 94. I wasn't at 95. Oh, okay. 94, the year before when Tupac threw the mic down and after he went to Tribe Called Quest. But no, 95, mm -hmm. I wasn't there. But I did produce the ones, obviously. Mm -hmm. 99, 2000, 2001, I wrote and produced all of those Source Awards. So is it fair to say, though, right, just pushing back on that, Devil's Advocate, um... I mean, there were rappers getting robbed back in the day. We just didn't have the internet to talk about it. It's, and, but it know. just wasn't, let me kill you. Let no, me, this let, is true. Yeah, this let, is true. Let me walk into Roscoe's yeah. in yeah. the middle of the afternoon. No, this is true. And rob you while your girl this is there. Is true. People's eating a, a chicken and waffles. This is and true. And your daddy is waiting outside in a car while you just saw yeah. your son go murder somebody. Yeah, yeah. Now, yes. That's a difference, right? It is a difference. Right. But I, I, but what I'm saying is that's that's not hip hop though, right? So, or so what I'm saying is, do we have niggas just doing nigga shit, and just happen to be rappers doing nigga shit, 100%. or is it the genre? You see what I I'm saying? The you know, one thing I'll yeah. say is, somebody people have asked me about this because obviously yeah. the show I just did, <clears throat> right? Is that this part, which I think Fifty says really well. Mm -hmm. I think, and then by the way, when we talk about the show, mm -hmm. Fifty Hip Hop Homicides came because Fifty got shot and mm -hmm. he lived through it, and mm -hmm. he was very close to Pop, mm -hmm. and that broke his heart, right? Mm -hmm. And that this kid who I liked, and he was suspicious about how it happened. Mm -hmm. Once you get, the problem is that you become famous because of how hard a gangster or how many bitches you got or mm -hmm. how you can pop your ass or whatever girl, or whatever mm -hmm. it is. But then you can't stay in that world, in that environment mm -hmm. because, re you know, rest in peace, my man, take off. Yeah. You got to be smart. You can't be in the three in the morning doing whatever. You can't still be in environments and be a superstar because... Mm -hmm. You know, excuse my language, but just niggas is out of control. Yeah. Like, and they're off the lean. They're yep. off Percocet. These young boys don't give a fuck. Mm -hmm. They're doing whatever. So you got to be smart about where you put yourself. So mm -hmm. to answer your question, yes, niggas are doing niggas shit. But once you become 50, you know, take off. Mm -hmm. Once you become PNB rock. You know, I was different. with Fabio mm -hmm. Foreign when we did the hip hop homicides. And he had a security guard walking around with him everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that that's cool. That's not what I did all of this work for 25, 30 years for y'all to have to live like that. But at this point, the lawlessness and the disrespect for life is at a place that I can't even put my 
you, you can't even talk to kids anymore. You understand right. what I'm saying? Yeah. Like you'll be able to talk to people yeah. and figure it out. Yeah. They don't give a fuck. They all yeah. got guns. They don't care. And it's just a, like a disrespect. But I think it's not just the music. Mm-hmm. It's systemic. Mm-hmm. It's the lack of, you know, opportunities in those communities, the lack of fathers in some of these guys, mm-hmm. the lack of OGs telling them what the hell you're doing. There's no code. It's just a free for all. And I think we're in a political climate where people are stressed and have anxiety from the government, mm-hmm. from Donald Trump to the streets to COVID. So it's like the perfect storm of bad things happening. Yeah. You know, and I and I will say that the social media part of it, yes, the clout chasing, yeah, it exactly let me wave it. wave yeah. my gun, let me threaten yeah. you. You know, our show Hip Hop Homicides, which premiered on WeTV, NBA Youngboy, we did an episode on King Von. Mm-hmm. King Von and NBA Youngboy was going back and forth on the internet live, like they're yeah. internet beefing live. Right. And so that internet beef literally affected their situation for somebody for sure. who get murdered. For sure. It, you know, it, it was a different things that happened yeah. to get to that place, but yeah. he ends up punching a guy. Yeah. That guy, the other guy shoots him, you know what yeah. I mean? It kills him. That, the, but the internet was the basis. Mo3, another artist that we did in Dallas, he was beefing back and forth with some guys in Texas. Mm-hmm. And I think he might've posted a video of him and one of the guy's baby mamas yep. with his kids yep. chains on. The, mm-hmm. the guy's, you know, kids had mm-hmm. Mo3's chains on and homeboy wasn't, we wasn't having that. Right. And he tracked him and shot him down in yep. the middle of the, the day on the freeway. Yeah. All traced back to social media. Exactly. Real shit. So doing the show Hip Hop Homicide, so I mean, you see a common thing that it has nothing to do with, like we say, rap beef. This is bullshit and street shit that just happens to come through rap. Correct. You're correct. Right. Yeah. Right. But I just, I'm not sure what to do. I, I don't yeah. know the answer. I wish I could tell you what the answer yeah. is. I don't. Yeah. <clears throat> People have asked me that. You know, I did the show. <clears throat> To try to humanize these young men and show mm-hmm. three to three dimensional portraits. Mm-hmm. You know, thank God P came one and he was able mm-hmm. to clarify some stuff about the episode we did mm-hmm. about Soldier Slim. What did he clarify? I'm I think that curious. he showed that Soldier Slim had a lot of issues on his own drug yeah. use. Very yeah. erratic guy. Yeah, um, probably was blaming, blaming P for shit that he had nothing to do with. Mm-hmm. You think P? You know, people artists they get on the label. You know, they mm-hmm. think the the label is the savior for sure. He, I can give you fifty thousand this week and you go fuck it all up. Mm-hmm. That's money I owed you. And you're like, give me another 50 because you think you deserve for whatever. Exactly. Uh, how much P put into the marketing, how much he put. But, right. you know. So I get it. Mm-hmm. But I do think that mm-hmm. it's good that P was able to get on and talked about the care and love that he had for Soldier, mm-hmm. but he couldn't control somebody who was on drugs. And obviously from what mm-hmm. you know, he's went through personally, mm-hmm. mental health and addiction is a very mm-hmm. serious thing, which mm-hmm. Soldier Slim did do. You know. Yeah. So doing this hip hop homicide, did you... Again, through your investigations, did you uncover some shit that you was like, wow, like, damn, like it was some shit that the public didn't know? Yeah. Um, you know, there's a few episodes. I don't want to give it all the way out, but one mm-hmm. of them um, you'll see uh, coming up this week with King Vaughn. Mm-hmm. Um, one of his relatives was out at the scene when he got shot and basically said, I saw police shooting somebody and killed him. Mm-hmm. Nobody's put that out in the media. And so mm-hmm. we were able to take her there and she <clears throat> talked about it. And so we, you know, we just want to give a lot of times when our communities, things like this happen, there's a no snitching, mm-hmm. right? Which we don't want to do. And then they don't trust law enforcement. So they're right. probably a little bit more prone to trust me right. and Van Lathan. Shout out to Van who's Shout the host of Van. the show yeah. because we're from their community and they can talk a little bit more forward with us. Right. But yes, we did. And we're able to get people to talk and do situations mm-hmm. on the show, which I don't think that law enforcement or people were able to do. Right. Um, and so, you know, it, it is a challenge, you know, the trauma of all these families. You know, imagine you, FPG Duck's mom, who's lost two of her sons and like mm-hmm. 10 people in the hood. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? King Von, where he grew up in Oblox, so many people got Right. He said, when you step outside, it's on. You can't avoid it. You know, by the time you're 14, right. 15 in some of these neighborhoods, right. that's a wrap. So I think that's what we wanted to do is just <clears> shed light on it. But also, if there's any way we can advance the case and get mm-hmm. some, you know, some con- mm-hmm. you know, some clearance or some, some, yeah. you know, about the situation so that people understand what happened. We were definitely about that, right? What but you- again, I think it was not to try to solve a crime necessarily, mm-hmm. or to provide more information about it, and to let the families and of the people get some closure, right? Right? Because a lot of times these cases, I'm not sure you know, don't get an investigation. A right. lot of them are still in court. Pop Smokes, murderers have barely went to court. XX and Tashion, who we did as well, those guys have not went to trial. Um, Soldier Slim. Nobody's ever been convicted of his murder. Mm-hmm. Magnolia Shorty, thank God some guys did convict of, of mm-hmm. her murder. Mo three, the suspects are still on trial. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Nip is one of the few ones, I think, neighborhood Nip, rest in peace, right. 
where they had him on camera. Right. So it was pretty hard for him not to get convicted. Right. But generally speaking, I don't think police care about solving murders in hip hop. Wow. And I think, you know, as they said in the Tupac doc, I said, just another nigga dead, right? Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow, that's deep. So, um, and Magnolia Shorty, you did her, yeah, she she got shot. Magnolia Shorty's a they rapper, shot her like rapper. like 20 times yeah, or something she, like that, right? she was hanging out with a guy who yeah. I guess she knew from Magnolia P probably know, and mm -hmm. you know, people know that he was a street guy mm -hmm. and was in, you know, allegedly a killer. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were coming out of a building and uh, they got to the gate and the guys jumped out of their cars when they were trying to get out of the gate. Mm -hmm. And they jumped on top of the car and shot through the car and they jumped on top of it. Wow. And they shot Magnolia Shorty 26 times. Wow, that's crazy. She wrong was with, place at the wrong time. She was with Cash Money, correct? Yes. Right, right. Second female rapper signed yeah. with Cash Money. Wow, yeah, that's deep. Um, I wanna I, I wanna go back to something because you also worked on Unsung, which is one of my favorite shows. Correct. Um, and you've been working on Unsung for how long? Oh man, I did nine seasons, ten seasons of mm -hmm. Unsung, and now it's funny because <clears throat> I start to appear in it as a guest from yeah. being a producer. But Unsung is a beautiful thing, man. I think yeah. you know one thing I learned from Unsung uh, is that we got so many beautiful black music artists, hip hop, R and B. And people just want to know their stories. Like yeah. they just, they love people. The artists forget that they think, well, I don't want to show my story because it looks like I fall off. But mm -hmm. people love to see when you got the money, For sure. you got the girl, For you sure. went through it, you lost it all, yeah. you had to get it back. Yeah. So you know, unsung has been a been a journey, man. I'm, yeah. I'm blessed to have done I'm that show. I'm curious, bro, because I kind of have a, a, a I'd like to say a connection uh, unofficially to unsung. Okay. Um, where, where I'm curious, where did the concept of unsung come from? Hmm. Where's the concept of Unsung? And I'm asking for a reason. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the genesis of Unsung came mm -hmm. from some executives at TV One who wanted to do their mm -hmm. own kind of like behind the music. Okay. Because a lot of the black artists were never getting treated correct on black, you know, behind the music. When you look at behind the music, it was like rock and roll, or yes, whatever. Yes, for sure. And so they developed the show. Um, and then this company called A-Smith produced those first ones. Mm -hmm. I think the first Unsung was The, the Barges. Barges. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Phyllis Hyman. Yeah. Uh, the Clark sisters and Donnie Hathaway. Yeah. I think they only did four mm -hmm. as like a, the first season. Mm -hmm. Now Unsung is on season 13, almost yeah. 200 some episodes. I love it. But yeah. So the reason I'm asking, cause like no bullshit, bro. Um, I had a concept years ago before Unsung came out. Oh damn. Called Unsung Heroes. Oh you did? Oh shit. So at the time I was working with um, Matty Rich. Oh, Matty Rich, okay. Yeah, Matty Rich. Shout and, out Matty Rich. And, and this is when they were doing, this is where shit was straight to DVD, way right. before streaming. And so um, I said, I told Matty, I said, man, I have an idea. I want to do a show called Unsung Heroes, mm. which talks about your, you know, your singer's favorite singer who right. don't get the accolades, right? And, um, First person on my list was Elder Bard. Uh, <laughs> them DeBarge's the was a wild I family, I had DeBarge, <laughs> I had Confunction, I had pretty much everybody who came to pass over the years. Okay. Uh, the only difference with mine is I, I kind of broadened it to where it was musical groups, but it was also athletes. You oh, know, okay. your Bill Russells and people well, that just- it's funny now, Unsung is yeah. now finally going into sports. Ah. Not a kind of trailblazer, yeah. but it, it took a minute, but yes, you're yeah, right. You, you yeah. saw the future. Yeah, I Big did. Court. Yeah, yeah, I you did. was just ahead of your hey, time. So, so, so I always <laughs> wonder, now mind you, at the time, I I'm just saying, you know, I don't know, but I know Maddie was cool with uh Tony. Was it Jenkins? Tony Jenkins, yeah. Tony You're Jenkins. Correct. Tony was Jenkins at, was at TV1. Was the president of TV1 who started that. Yeah, yeah was, so at the time. Hey, man, don't put me no legal situation. Oh, no, 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 no. I, I ain't, no, up, no, 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 no. I wasn't there. No, but I ain't correct. tripping on yeah, that. Yeah, but I ain't yeah, tripping I mean, on that. But, I, you know, but I just, know. I think I, I had a winner, you know what I'm saying? So I'm not saying that it was just to the point to where when the show came out, people were hitting me like, bro, you got your show green. I was like, what? It oh, was really? like, okay. yeah, you got your show. I seen that. Did you guys go pitch it at TV One? You don't I didn't, but okay. I know that I gave it to Maddie, and Maddie okay. was was talking with, okay. talking with Tony. He was okay. doing some shit with him. Okay. So I it could have you know, it okay. could have just been a uh, coincidence. But I love the show though. You good, know good. what I mean? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's I, a dope I, ass I show. worked on a lot of episodes. Uh yeah. Houdini, Kumo D, I produced mm -hmm. uh Bone Thugs and Harmony, E forty. DJ Quick, DJ Quick, Quick, uh, damn near everybody. Too short, yeah, E forty. Um, mm -hmm. Adina Howard, mm -hmm. uh, Fat Boys. Fat Boys was the first uh, hip hop on mm -hmm. Zoom. It's, it's still going, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, they're filming some episodes right now. I haven't done it in a few years, uh -huh. but no, it's good. It's yeah. good. You know, I think that those stories about music artists, people love it. They want to hear all the stories. Yeah, yeah. You know, I've, I've seen some wild, sure. wild stuff on Unsung. It's been a fun, yeah. a fun time. Yeah, yeah. So you have hip hop um, 
uh, homicide now. Um, what's what do you have next? What's what's what you got cooking? Um, I work. On I know that's big, the newest thing. Yeah, but. that's that's on WeTV mm-hmm. right now, mm-hmm. and all black, uh, hosted by Van Lathan, executive mm-hmm. produced by Fifty Cent, mm-hmm. and Mona Scott Young. And I work as the uh, executive producer, showrunner, mm-hmm. director, co-director. Um, that's on now. It's airing every mm-hmm. Thursday at nine o'clock on WeTV. Then repeats on All Black. Uh, I'm working on another big documentary that's rooted in the culture for Hulu. That's coming out that I'm directing next summer. Um, still, you know, on the Roger Troutman mm-hmm. movie tip, which I think mm-hmm. is moving. Nice. I think that's one of my, um, nice. you know, people talking about their dream project. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, um, Roger Troutman. I did Roger Troutman and Zap Unsung, mm-hmm. and I knew Roger in real life. And oh so, wow, um, that's a crazy story. You know, brothers shoot each other. Yeah, it's super crazy. You know, bro. it's a very crazy story. So that, and you know, I do produce my own stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe you'll see a Buster documentary. You never know. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. What about some Bay Area shit? What about you know the back at your roots? In you know, uh, what, let me ask you this real quick. As a producer, um, do you do you uh, enjoy doing um, unscripted uh, opposed to doing scripted? I do like both. Movies? You know, I, uh-huh. my, again, I'm just a storyteller. You know, mm-hmm. I've done some scripted uh, movies and diff- stuff like mm-hmm. that. I got some coming out next year, but mm-hmm. I just mm-hmm. enjoyed of telling stories. You know, I remember when I used to be at the source. Yeah. One of the greatest joys that I would have, and even at the LA Times when mm-hmm. I was a journalist, you know, I would write a story or Suge or fucking whatever it might be or Dr. Dre. And uh, I would be on the train in New York or about here in LA or somewhere and I see somebody reading my story. Mm. And like, did they laugh when I wanted them to laugh? Yeah. You know, when I, when I screened one of my shows or something like that, did they cry when I wanted them to cry? Mm-hmm. Did they feel that? Did they get what I did? And so, um, you know, everybody has different jobs, but I have a weird job because you get to see what I do. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't see what you do at your job. I don't know if right. you're fucking around or what you're doing, but right. my job is a public job. Like, you get to see that. And so right. there is great joy um, in doing that for me. Mm-hmm. I enjoy telling the stories. You know, the hip-hop homicides. I don't want to say I enjoyed it because that was a little too... Mm-hmm. Uh, it's morbid as shit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're going to, you know, talking yeah. to moms and family members yeah. and going back to where people got shot. I went back to where X got shot and... The house where Pop got shot, and mm-hmm. I was on the freeway, literally walking where Mo Three got mm-hmm. murdered. But I think that it's important for the culture to have truth tellers like me mm-hmm. on the front lines who understand the culture and yes. who come from it and yeah. are there to preserve our integrity and yeah. to do the due diligence by it. You know, and so um, I usually enjoy it. You know, the yeah. project I'm doing on Hulu, I really enjoy it. It's a more fun project, but it's rooted in hip hop. Um, you know, hip hop is what I do. I, I'm a hip hop historian. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm, I'm blessed to survive four, five generations, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010s, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. Of, the, of the game. So who's your top five? Oh, I'm not going to get into that shit. You'll have to Come cut Come on, bro. <laughs> who's, who's your top five? <laughs> I, I ain't going to. Who's you your top five? You all these provocative questions, <laughs> deep stuff, who, who, like, you who, know, who, talking about who, all wrong. Who's your top That's five? That's such a hard. Well, come on, bro, man. Why you asking me that question? Who's your top five? Oh, you like, can break it down to to your old top five and your current top five. hard. That's like you talking about basketball, right? You, you, you're right. a sports guy. You play sports, football, right? You could talk about, um, you could say that the Warriors had the most, the best shooters on one team. Mm-hmm. You could say that Detroit Pistons were like the most uh, scrappy mm-hmm. defensive team. Mm-hmm. You could say that the Lakers was the Old most- Old school Pistons. Uh, yeah. Whatever, like the mm-hmm. most flamboyant, Classic, right? Yeah. There's different styles and yeah. hip hop is like styles. Right, Right, because there's Absolutely. somebody who's the best lyricist. Absolutely. Who made the best beats. Right. Who- had the most influence, right? right? And so I'm just gonna say that, you know, I'm gonna answer, but I, I just want to say, because yeah. you know, I know I already see people clicking right <laughs> yeah, now. Yeah, everybody, yeah. This shit is like and you know, a, you probably know a lot of these yeah, guys. So like, say oh, it. you don't fuck with me? Yeah, but I, I think, I think, you know, I'll say it like this. Um, it's personal though. It's, it's personal. Yeah, yeah it's, and it's subjective. It's my opinion. It's, it's, my subjective. Opinion. it's my opinion. Yeah. And believe me, you can say whatever you want, but it is a you know barbershop moment mm-hmm. where motherfuckers want to fight. But um, I do think that, and in my top five is just my top five, by the way. So, you know, I think that LL Cool J gets cut out of the conversation, but Mm -hmm. there was a point when he was the most dominant Mm -hmm. rapper, influential and lyrical Mm -hmm. rapper from like the 80s to early 90s, beginning of the 2000s a little bit. So I'm going to put L probably like around fourth. Okay. Right. Um, And I think, you know, I think Nas uh, has had the most complete career Mm -hmm. of any rapper. Mm -hmm. Where he came out, his debut was a classic. He changed the game lyrically. More than most of his work has been pretty good. Mm -hmm. Lyrically, he's one of the greatest storytellers in the history of it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? He had some duds here and there, but I think he's had the most complete career other than the person in the number one. Right. Um, So I would put Nas at fourth, LL, you know, and then Nas. Uh, I do think that Pac uh, 
is debatable. You know, people say mm -hmm. him as the greatest, but I think even if he wasn't lyrically mm -hmm. the greatest rapper, mm -hmm. he had the most influence. Impact, yeah. And that his look, his style, what he did, how he rapped, how that has influenced so many people. 50, you could look 50, Ja, they just mm -hmm. Tupac, you know, no disrespect to 50, I work with him, yeah. Ja Rule, but they all stole from Tupac. Mm -hmm. People mm -hmm. today, you see they want to be Tupac. For sure. Right? So I think that Tupac falls into the number three position. And the number two is two people, and I know I'm not supposed to do that, but I think that KRS didn't keep going as much, mm -hmm. but his influence and his lyrics is bananas. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the same thing with Big and mm -hmm. with Chris Wallace, you know, Notorious B.I.G. He only had a couple of bodies of work, so it's not really fair to put him up there, but I do mm -hmm. think his impacts and his lyric would do that. So mm -hmm. I'd have to say... KRS and Biggie, I'm cheating with two. They share two. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm doing that. But okay. I think, you know, I don't I think Jay-Z is obviously the greatest rapper ever. Okay. Only because of this. <clears throat> His influence, he made the party records, mm -hmm. he made the lyrical records, he went through all of the beefs. He's transformed the culture from a business perspective. Again, I'm not just talking about the lyrics. If mm -hmm. you, y'all know you're purists and want to get in the mm -hmm. lyrics and the bars and all right. this other shit. I ain't, right. I ain't going <laughs> to fucking debate with you. Already been around long enough. Yeah. But I think Jay Z, if you look at from '96 to where he is now, has been the <clears throat> Michael Jordan of hip hop. Okay. Even if Michael Jordan didn't win more rings than Bill Russell, mm -hmm. his impact and how people play what he did. And how he transformed it to a billion dollar business mm. is why I say Jay Z okay. is number one. And That's he has solid. more platinum albums than I think, than all of them. You mm -hmm. know, you could put Kanye up there, but I think Kanye is one of the more creative mm -hmm. people. I wouldn't put him as a rapper. Right. But right. just in terms of the styles, I would have to say Jay Z is the Muhammad Ali. I respect that. That's yeah. solid. What'd yeah. you think, Jay? I mean, it's it's a good, it's very thoughtful, yeah. and this man comes from a journalist background. Yeah, yeah. So that's from, just my opinion. Yeah, yeah right, sure. right. And everybody, every fan, you know, different generations, yeah. they're gonna yeah. be like, they think their guy from their generation. You know is the who guy. my number one is? Who is that? Who's ironically from your soil? Who? Well, it's not from his soil though. It is. Hayward, it's not. Well, who's Hayward, that? Oakland, Spice One. <laughs> Shout out to Spice One. That is the craziest fucking number one I've ever heard. That's my my that's number my one, E40. E40, E40, E40. 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 Okay. E40. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. I think that uh, back to what you said, I don't think I grew up in a sack. Okay. E40 is a god. In right. Yeah, yeah. We had Brother Lynch, X Ray to Sebo, 40. Right. Yeah. That's that's y'all that, shit. Yeah. That's that's us, right? But 40 really inspired a lot of them too. Oh yeah. I mean his lyrics and his mm -hmm. independent hustle, whatever. I you know. Earl Devin gets his yeah, credit. Hopefully, but, Forty, you watch this. We yeah. gonna have to do your 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 biography. You know what I'm saying? He, he's shit. like, you know, we've been talking about the Real No shit. Limit. Pete <clears throat> talks about getting influenced by Forty. Yeah, right. Yeah, but I, uh, you know, I'm born in '81, so for me, Forty was what I grew up on. Right. And then as I got older, and I watched people pop their collar, or do all the, I was mm -hmm. like, damn, we've been listening to that since yeah. like '89. And see, when I first started, Melly Mel was the god from where I started. You know what right. I mean? In terms of right. like the learning early 80s he was the, right. the the bar and obviously he didn't keep going and do whatever else right. but um it's highly debatable yeah you know? yeah for sure spice yeah. one would be my first but you know i got ice tea ice cube up in there yeah if i got yeah. down and out i would yeah. have to get into that and i would get into yeah. big daddy Kane's scarface of the world scarfaces mm -hmm. if we went to that mm -hmm. 10 uh sure. you know i and i think i'm trying to think about the greatest female rapper i hate to separate like gender right, right. but uh that's a tougher one that's a tough one too yeah. greater greatest yeah. female yeah I mean, there's there's only a handful. Of it, like, that's true. You got the Queen that's Latifahs, true. the Lil Kims, uh, MC Light. MC Light's right. Yeah, and I do think you know, I don't personally, I, I don't like how she moves and whatever else. But I think Nicki Minaj is a, is a beast with that pen. Yeah, yeah, she, yeah, is, she is a beast with that pen, and definitely. she sold a lot of records. Definitely. and has had a humongous. Impact. I would say take that away Latifah's from probably number huh? one. You though. can't take yeah. that from her. Yeah. But Latifah didn't do enough work. She like said like it's you know Ice T even is my home, big homie. I was like, fuck this rapping. I'm yeah. about to go get this Hollywood money. <laughs> well, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, I guess that's what I'm thinking yeah, of with yeah. her. The same thing happened with L, right? Yeah, L, yeah. L was like, you know, I've been doing this hip hop, but let me go get this. Yeah, you know, L fifteen sold dollars a lot of records. Years. Yeah, he sold a lot of records. Very impactful artist. That's why I always put him in. Yeah, there. yeah, L was dope. Um, you know, real. Mine's cool. a biased list, so I like his list because it's thoughtful. And I, I have more. <laughs> mine of a is just Bay Area. Yeah, from Bay Area. I'm from the Bay Area, but yeah. obviously I've been around and seen all this stuff, and I reviewed these albums, and you know, it's so funny. I was uh, thinking the other day, because I'm hopefully going to do this Source-related project mm -hmm. for next year's the 50th anniversary of hip-hop. And uh, when Dr. Dre released the Chronic 2000, or whatever was it, Chronic? Was that that one? Mm -hmm. Chronic 2001. Yeah, and we at the Source, what we used to do is 
we would pass the album all the way around and everybody put like a little chart and put your little number on it. So mm -hmm. 3.5 mics, 4 mics or whatever. Unless it was a made man. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Shout out Benzino. Dave, which Dave talked about that yeah, on Dave, the show. Dave, Dave, yeah. Dave can't try to front. Dave, you know what it is. Dave, you know you changed a few mics here and there for your boys. Don't even try to get in front of it. But no, we, um, we did the source uh, mics and I wrote the, I think I wrote the 2001. And we uh, didn't give it five mics, mm -hmm. which we should have, and because uh, there was some bias, and we were like, mm -hmm. oh, you know, we, the, my five mics was like, yeah, yeah, she got to be like, <laughs> you know, she got she got to be a ten, Sierra, yeah. she got to be like the most yeah. beautiful yeah. one or whatever mm -hmm. to get that five mics. And mm -hmm. so, in the Source uh, Awards in two thousand and one, mm -hmm. when there was the fight, I think it was Earl, some people in the front thing, and then mm -hmm. snooping him on the stage, which I was working on that show. We were slated to give Dre a five mic award on the show. I don't know if people know. I don't know if Dave told you that. Wow. But wow. we had went to Dre's house, me mm -hmm. and Carlito. Was Dave there? I think Dave might have been there. Mm -hmm. And we had given him a five mic award, and Dre was supposed to come out on stage mm -hmm. before the fight happened, like right then. Wow. Wow. So yeah, we Dre, no, we was about to give you the five yeah. mic award. Okay. I'm sorry, Dre, that you didn't get the five mics. You deserved it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Let me ask you, what what's it like working with 50? 50 has, man, I love how 50 has just grown, you know what I mean? And become a mogul in his own right. right. What, what What's it like working with this 50? This of, 50, I think yeah. he's a smart guy. You know, before mm -hmm. I got this job as to be working on Hip Hop Homicides, I had to get an interview by him. Or not interview, but they, mm -hmm. you know, wanted me to work on it. And I talked to him and mm -hmm. we talked about what he wanted to do with the show. Um, he He's gotten inside of the belly of the beast and learned how to play the game, but still be 50. And mm -hmm. it's tough because he he's taken the stories of street life, BMF, mm -hmm. uh, hip hop homicides, whatever mm -hmm. it be, power, and translated it into mainstream world, mm -hmm. but still been able to stay 50 and talk his shit yep. and confront people Real. and do all yeah. of the wild shit that he normally yeah. do. But, you know, um, I think 50 learned a lot from the bad things that happened to him and has mm -hmm. taken advantage, you know, because when you look at Hove and, and, and Puff and P and all these people, he's Russell, Luke, He's up mm -hmm. there now with them. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. And has surpassed them, yeah. definitely from a television mm -hmm. film perspective. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Although Pete obviously has produced a lot of mm -hmm. stuff like that. But I think 50 is a genius. And I think that when he almost got his life taken from him, that changed his, his whole life. Mm -hmm. And so obviously the show I'm doing now started from him. So right. 50 is a genius. He's a wild boy. You know, I don't want to get on he his is. bad side. So Because he, <laughs> he might, you know, he, th he throw the daggers. <laughs> he do. I know he'll start trolling you yeah, and yeah, shit. Yeah, yeah, I like yeah. I want to stay with the fam, you know, with um, the end of the, the cover. Um. So, you know, lastly, I want to ask you, so being that you're so ingrained, like I said, you're so deeply rooted in hip hop, um, what do you think, you know, what message would you give the youngsters, you know what I'm saying? And, and where do you think that we can go as a culture to try to curb all the, the, the bullshit, the destructive, you know, the destructive culture, the divisiveness, even the shit on Clubhouse? Like, what advice would you give the youngsters? That's a tough one because I think, again, I think it's a very layered issue. Some of the violence it is. problems that it we is. have, I think it's, like I said, it's systemic. Mm -hmm. There's issues, there's gun violence, there's mm -hmm. gun control laws, mm -hmm. there's lack of uh, conflict le resolution skills yes. in a lot of our communities. Yes. Yes. Um, uh, there's lack of fathers to people say mm -hmm. stuff. People like me are mm -hmm. you, can be like, sometimes mm -hmm. they don't want to listen. I'm like, hey, mm -hmm. I was there when Tupac got, you know, he's in the hospital. Let me tell you how this story goes. You want to mm -hmm. see how it goes? That his mother's in pain, that all his homies around him get murdered, mm -hmm. that you... Shug, you know, this happens to him and Suge, and then after that, more people get killed. It's, it's a cycle, mm -hmm. you know, and it's no different, you know, I don't, I think it's paid in full um, when Cameron said, niggas get shot every day, B. Right, right, desensitized to right. it. Right, yeah. and so I do think that there was a desensitization, if that's a word, mm -hmm. and a lack of respect about life. That's mm -hmm. the paramount thing, mm -hmm. you know, and I'll say this because I work at a different level in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. When a big company's, Companies that I work for, you can you know name them a Viacom or whoever AMC or whoever it may be. When they got beef, they take each other to court. Mm -hmm. Right. They don't pull out their nine and go find try to find him in the hood. And I just wish that we would get back to, you know, in the fifties, sixties or whatever. Black people, we didn't have access to mainstream stuff, so we had to be more of a community. We had our own mm -hmm. businesses there. We had our own cleaners. You couldn't go wherever else. So I think we need to get back to that part. Mm -hmm. I think the access to mainstream wide America and opportunities and the internet, this little phone, this phone that you got mm -hmm. here is almost like a passport, right? Mm -hmm. Now you can go see everything all over the world mm -hmm. and whatever. In some ways, I think that's been destructive to I us. I, I think agree. that we as a community got to get back together. It's like Malcolm X, you got to get back around your table and figure it out. And uh, 
I'm hopeful, but I do think that, you know, we need to start to taking people like Instagram and Facebook to task. Yes. You put all this out, you let people wave these guns, they, you know, obviously mm-hmm. try to stop it. Mm-hmm. But um, we need more safeties, like checks and balances in our community, bro. I agree. Yeah, you, 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 that father, you think that that was okay for your son to go up in Roscoe's and shoot this dude and take his chain? Right, right. You said that's okay? Mm-hmm. Who, what father that's thinks that that's okay? Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, and this is the young, young kid, and I don't know what happened <clears throat> with, with the guy from Migos, but yeah. people start shooting and whatever. Like, and, it, you know, you, you, you got to be smarter. Like, yeah. And I'm not but saying that's... just go fight. <clears throat> you know what I'm saying? You have to go fight somebody, but right. if there's a way to stop it from getting to that point, yeah. you know what I mean? Well, like I said, man, I think it's accountability too, bro. I think we have to do our work as a community, as a culture. You know what I'm saying? We have to do our self work. We deal with each other so heavy handedly. You know, we. You know, as me and Yuck was saying, it's almost like that Willie Lynch shit runs really deep. Right. And 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 I, like I said, uh, full transparency, I've had to you know modulate my own shit right. and and do my work to to. You There's know, a self stop hate that. that's it inherent is. in this it situation. Is. And it I, is. I, you know, I come from Oakland, and I'm not sure about KC. Mm-hmm. There's a crabs in a barrel mentality. Like yeah, fuck that. It's every you know what I mean, fuck that. That that that, every that boy P and B got that chain. I want yep. that chain. Yeah. Fuck that. I don't want to <clears> go do the work and do all of the time in the studio. Right. He did that. And somebody asked me the other day. Are the record companies responsible for profiting off of this? And you mm-hmm. know, Tupac died, so millions of records, and obviously mm-hmm. Time Warner, whoever mm-hmm. made a bunch of money, mm-hmm. or whoever else, Biggie. Um, it is a two-way street, though, because right. nobody forced you to go write "Murder, Death, Kill" in the studio and smoke of all of that weed and do that sherm or do whatever it is yeah. you're doing, or drinking lean to put those messages out there. Yeah, right. So you can't say the record company maybe right. you think that's what you're supposed to write. Right. Maybe Cardi <clears throat> B thinks that she's supposed to write booty popping, mm-hmm. you know, titty shaking. Music, but there it's a two way street where mm-hmm. what you write and create, and then also what they're going to put out, and so they, we got to check each other. Yep. But I do believe it starts with us first. I agree. I got, I got a follow up question because you come from a journalist background, so and you just said something that's super interesting to me. You said you need to hold people like Facebook and Instagram to task. What's your thought on the reverse of that, which is like Elon opens Twitter up for like anybody to say anything? No, I just like, think that we just got to get a better, you know, he, he's out. I think he, he fancies himself as the, the wild, wild west sheriff. And he's just going to be, I think that's his personality. But, you know, it's weird because a part of me feels like as a journalist about free speech, like I'm all for free speech and it is the world you're supposed to do it. But there has to be some sense of uh, if you writing or doing things that encourage a January 6th situation and you're telling people to come down and to attack and almost murder people and then you're getting you know, uh, Pelosi's husband killed or shot or beat up for whatever, then you, you once you're encouraging violence and doing like that, that's a little bit off the chain. Or, or saying hate speech or whatever, so. Which is uh, what's happening. Correct, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, so Elon is what... Musk is only gonna infuriate the situation and make it boyer by let's be whatever. So I, I, I don't know what the answer is, but I do say for as a black man in America, my concern is my race and my community and making sure that young brothers that have a son and and daughters and that that we don't kill each other you know that's my priority right you know i can't control all of the other stuff but right i do think that everybody is culpable because mm-hmm. you know instagram and facebook you're making a gang of money all right. these dudes and all their views and blah 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 and right. whatever you ain't paying no funeral costs of whatever beefs that they had on your exactly. platform right you get away with nothing when they go to court they post the videos right now the big thing is people getting convicted for rap lyrics you know we're going to do the show on um is it Y.N. Melly mm-hmm. in Florida, Murder on My Mind? Yep. Where he's now, they're taking his lyrics to yep. put on trial. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's yeah. X-rated in Sacramento back yep. in Same thing. 93. Yep. C-Bow right. as well. Yeah, C-Bow. so I just think we got to, you know, nobody's telling you to censor what you say mm-hmm. because if you rap about what you see and you grew up in these environments and that's what you see, Old Block, East Oakland, you know what mm-hmm. I'm saying, Kansas City, then that's true, but you got to balance it is all I'm going to say. Yeah, and I agree. You can't take the violence are the things that you put on the record and put it into real life. Right, I agree. I just did a whole show, brother, way, and at, as we end this, um, our communities are in crisis. There's a mental health problem and a trauma amongst a lot of these young brothers that I don't know what to do about. Mm-hmm. And a lot of them have guns, and a lot of them are on Percocet, they're on lean, they have anger issues, they just don't know how to handle when something goes bad or beefing with right. your brother and there's a jealousy in the air mm-hmm. towards people who've made it and yep. a sense of I don't want to work for what PNB chain and I'm gonna go take that shit. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a viciousness too. Um 
Hey, it's deep, bro. I mean, you know, listen, at the end of the day, man, brothers like me and you, we got to keep putting, you know, an alternate narrative out there and keep trying to lace All it. I'm like the young, you know? like the OGs that told me, you know, young, young player, don't go that way. Yep. Go do this. Try to stay That's safe. It. Do whatever. There was a, there was a like, they might have been doing whatever, they might have whatever, but right. they told me if they saw somebody that was going in the right path. And I don't think that's the case as much mm -hmm. now. So, I mean, I'm gonna just keep telling my stories, my brother, and um, yeah. try to keep it positive. They call me Positive Frank for a reason. Okay. Oh, that's what the P stands for. P Frank stands for Positive Frank. Oh, damn, I always thought I stood for pimp. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just messing with you, bro. <laughs> I just that's not with true. <laughs> but I mean, it could have been at some points, but that's not nah, the literal I'm just messing with you, brother. Yeah, yeah. Well, hey, listen, I appreciate you stopping by the show, making uh, you know, time, because I know you're a busy man, bro. And uh, you've done, you know, you've contributed so much to the culture for the last, what, damn near three decades. Yeah. You know what I mean? Early so, 90s when I first yeah. officially got on. But obviously yeah. in the 80s, I had the cardboard, yeah. like 84, you know, when I was yeah. taking it at the could lunchtime. You, could you windmill? I, I had an uprock that was savage. Oh, you could yeah. windmill? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, was, shit. I, was I could never windmill, yeah. bro. The head spin was a little out. tough for me. Yeah, yeah. well, man, we appreciate you, my brother. So, hey, thank you for coming to the show. My brother, I don't shake with that hand. That's that's, that's messed up. I just the money. did that because I didn't want to come over. Yeah, we're going to come over the mic. <laughs> I don't want to mess up the money. I'm superstitious. You know what I'm saying? It's but thank all you for having me, man. Continue yeah, success. For you I, I appreciate it, brother. And, yeah. you know, you've all, and again, this is a good brother. I'm not just saying that. You know, he's always. Uh, open to communicate with me anytime I, I have questions or whatever, whatever. Like you say, you defer to the OGs, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, I've had young. It's, it's all, yeah. it's all, we all connected, you know what I mean? Yeah. In, this, in this hip hop nation. And For sure. Again, like I said, peace, love, unity, and having fun is why I'm still here. There it is, right and, there. And, 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 and the good looking girls, too. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Big Court, Holding Court Podcast, P. Frank Williams, producer Ken, we out, bro. Yeah. Karma's on the way. What goes around comes around. Karma's on the way. There's nothing you could do now. You gotta pay.